Okay, so welcome everyone to the Be Well Hub experience. Uh, we've got um, an interesting topic today, the imposter syndrome. I think we've all suffered from this somewhere along the lines. And if you haven't, then you're perfect. And uh, if you're perfect, then maybe <laughs> we shouldn't be here. Right? Every, everyone suffered from this, right? Uh, today we have Rachel Lemon, is our, is our co-host, guest speaker. Uh, the title of the, the talk today is um, Unveiling Imposter Stories, Rewrite Your Narrative with Rachel Lemon. Okay, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, understanding imposter syndrome, breaking free from self-doubt, reframing your perspective, embracing vulnerability, and so these are some of the topics we're going to hit, we're going to, we're going to try and hit on. Okay, so... Uh, let's see with, with the time that we have. A little bit about Rachel. Rachel is an exceptional mindset coach with a proven background in personal growth, professional development, and leadership. With her unique blend of science and spirituality, Rachel empowers individuals to rewrite their imposter stories and step into their full potential. Okay. So she calls herself, or she's been called the mindset alchemist. Love it, mindset alchemist, great. Guiding women leaders to overcoming limiting beliefs, imposter stories, and banish burnout, mindset coaching for confidence, clarity, and vision, empowering you to lead with feminine energy. So, I think I think that's quite a lot about Rachel. Maybe Rachel, you can tell us a little bit <laughs> yeah. more. Or uh, can... Yeah. So the uh, obviously you explained lemonade is um, my background's in healthcare. So I I was a pharmacist before um, and um, in, worked in pharmacy, pharmacy professional, um, and so obviously in a hospital setting for most of my career. I was also and then I did like national level leadership um, with Department of Health and NHS Education England and some other strategic level work and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. So the aid part, um, first aid kind of made sense, you know, lemonade, first aid, like helping people, but in a different way. And then the alchemist again comes back to this fusion of um, the old if you think about the old mickey mouse cartoon where he was the alchemist it was like making medicines with herbs and things like that but it all kind of links back in although chat gpt has ruined some of my favorite words because it's like everyone's like an alchemist now or so although it was like for me it's got a personal meaning and attachment to my story yeah you do see a lot of people using some of the words even like you know in coaching transformation everything's transformational with two rockets at the end isn't it so <laughs> you're kind of like no, save us save us from this but yeah I think um I think my kind of approach is helping people to show up unapologetically as themselves and um not everything our minds tells us is true and I think that takes us into the imposter stories and uh, so although it's called imposter syndrome I kind of reframe it as imposter stories because, you know, we all we've all got stories in one or more parts of our lives that we tell ourselves where we say we're not good enough or we've got doubts. Um, if it's a new job, for example, um, or, or like you said, even a new hobby, you know, if we take up a new hobby, there's always a part of us that's like, why did I sign up for this? Like, you know, I'm not going to be good enough. Like for me today, I could be like, oh, I've signed up to do this talk everyone here could be like a professor and like I could be the dumbest person in the room so we we all have those like moments of those stories that we tell ourselves that stop us can for some people paralyze them and stop them actually doing anything and interestingly um it's more common in women and there's been some research and um the majority of women tell themselves more stories. I don't know why, whether they are more, whether we're more open to admitting it or whether it is we genuinely do feel those things like we're not good enough, we're not smart enough. Um, especially when we go talk about leadership, 
And interestingly, some of the studies from years ago showed that if there was a job position, 20, um, only women would only apply if they had like 80% of the criteria, whereas guys will apply if they've got 20. So when you talked about fake it till you make it, like guys will be like, yeah, I don't care if I meet the criteria, I'm just going to get that job. And women will be like, but I don't tick all the boxes. So mm. I can't even apply for it. So that's kind of fascinating that, you know, it's not gender gender neutral. It does affect both sexes and it can affect anyone from any walk of life. You know, you could be um, a college student or you could be like a CEO of a big organisation. You will still have those moments. And I think, again, we with like lots of things, we should just normalise them. And I think we well, once we realise that we coexist with these things um, and learn to manage them and talk to those voices in our head that are saying, you know, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, or you can't do this, then we then we learn to kind of overcome them, don't we? And I don't know, people are nodding their heads. I don't know how many of you have told yourselves or stopped yourselves from doing something you really wanted to do because you thought you weren't good enough. I don't know if someone wants to take that, Daniel. <laughs> <Everyone's> I, like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I've definitely done that before. I think you are 100% correct. It has impacted probably everybody in the world at some point. Maybe not sociopaths, but they're like 1% of the population. But um, <laughs> it's still, I, it, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that has not experienced this. Did you want an example or were you just curious? Yeah, yeah, share with us. It's interesting to learn different people's perspectives. I mentioned sociopaths earlier, actually, yeah, to Gary before we started. I said they're probably the only people that don't acknowledge that they have this. <laughs> or at least we just haven't found that out yet. They might acknowledge it another way. But okay. <laughs> it's just best to avoid them. Uh, what, what about you, Chris? Do you have, uh, are you, do you have an experience with this? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, even just starting as a coach, I was the first thing I did was compare myself to some of the, the largest coaches out in the world. Right. And you start trying to measure up to that you know, unrealistic ideal early on. So that was uh, that was definitely something that I had to overcome personally and kind of find what my voice was in the coaching space. Yeah. yeah. David, what about you when you were David Stevens? An example of self-doubt, imposter syndrome. Did I get the mic on? Yeah. Okay, great. I've been very fortunate. Um, even at my very first job out of college, I had a great uh, servant leader as a mentor. And I've been my life has been full of those guys. And I came from a good family that uh, taught us what we could do and things like that. So... Every time I went to a different job or do something else, I went in there with full confidence. I knew I could do it. And uh, I really haven't had that problem, which is kind of weird. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting as well, actually, like when I looked at some of the studies, like there are, although anybody can be have imposter syndrome, that there are um, people who've got anxiety, depression and trauma related will experience it more so mm. the fact that you said you grew up in an environment where people are like more like you can you can do it and my dad was the same he's like you can be anything you want yeah you know, there, there was no like you can't do this because you're a girl type stuff that a lot of women face my dad was like if you want to be a scientist be a scientist if you want to be a train driver you know so I was, and my granddad was very much the same. They were like, you, you can be whoever you want to be. The choice is yours. So I do think there is a bit of a difference there. If you grow up in a family where limiting beliefs are more common and, you know, you inherit them, we all inherit limiting beliefs from our family and from our teachers. And as you said, mentors. So I think that's really valuable, isn't it? Having people that are cheering us on and also people that are able to step in when we do have those moments and remind us, you know, when you're thinking about applying for a job and you say to your friend, for example, like, oh, I'm, I really think I want to do this or become a coach. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm good enough. Then if having somebody who's there saying, actually, of course you're good enough, you're brilliant. Like everyone comes to you for help. You're the person that 
people reach out to having someone else who who reminds us that's really kind of like a valuable resource i think i think and, what you're saying rachel is yeah in an, no. ideal, in an ideal world that's what we'd yeah, like really. to i think david was very fortunate to have a supportive family and background but in many cases it's like you know we are I mean, myself, I'm just talking about personal experiences thrown into the deep end that is sink or swim. And um, you're also afraid to ask other people because other people are not really supporting you. And so until you take the first few steps and you become a coach or a teacher or an entrepreneur, people just don't recognize you for the potential that you have, but for what you have, what you are in that moment. It takes, it takes someone a little bit more illuminated, let's say enlightened to see something more than what they see in front of them, if that makes sense. Right. And I think you, there's a couple of points, like you said about um, fake it till you make it. There's a danger there, isn't there? Because that feeds into the imposter story that actually I'm not good enough and I'm pretending to be good enough. I'm pretending to be able to do the thing. So by that faking it, instead of perhaps reframing it to ourselves and other people and saying, I'm good at this, but I'm new. And I'm learning and this is my journey because, um, you know, I say, like, don't measure yourself using someone else's ruler. You know, because someone's going to be further along the, the journey than us. Like, um, I think it was Daniel that said, you know, if you're comparing yourself to someone like, um, gosh, what's his name? the uh, Tony Collins type, you know, someone who's really world famous coach, you know, you're not going to be him but you're not going to be him anyway because your own energy is different, isn't it? Your own style is going to be different. So when we have this um, comparisonitis where we're looking at somebody else who was us 10 steps back, we, we need to remember that when we're comparing ourselves, we're seeing the version of them that's done all the work, that's maybe got a team supporting them, that's maybe got all of that kind of you know, they're further along the journey. And we don't always remember that, do we? And I think social media really sort of buys into that, doesn't it? Because you see people at their best rather than behind the scenes. Like you were saying when you started, Gary, um, you know, new business owner, you've got to learn everything. You know, so I might have been really shit hot at my job in an organisation. But then when I haven't got a finance team, <laughs> an accounts team, uh purchasing team i haven't got all of those people doing all of those things for me i'm then responsible to learn all of that stuff and i think as a business owner that's where the um imposter things start to come in because you're like i know i can do the coaching i know i'm good at that but i i can't i'm not i can't do all the other stuff that i need to do a question here, um, Rachel, is should, shouldn't there be some sort of like a benchmark? You were saying about not, not comparing yourself, but shouldn't there be some sort of goal and something to achieve to get there by a certain time? So looking at the Tony Robbins or looking at other, I don't know, um, mentors, let's say that we can try to, uh, to, to get close to, shouldn't that be part of the journey or not? Benchmarks. Interesting question. I think we should have goals that we set for ourselves. And I sort of work with more micro goals rather than like the massive. People can get fixed in a stuck mindset on I need to be at Z and they go want to be straight from A to Z and they don't do all of the journey along the way. And also, you know, like things happen, don't they? In life, we get lost, we get distracted we might think the thing that we think we want to do isn't actually the thing. And I don't know about you, but I've worked with lots of people who are doing something that they don't actually even want to do because they think they should. And so I think it's okay to kind of have a goal, a big goal, but we also need to not be so fixed that if that doesn't fit us when we're there or on the journey, we decide to, we want to do something different that we don't feel like a failure because we didn't do it. And I know in my life, I've done things, seen them through to the bitter end, when actually failing failing is almost doing that rather than saying, actually, this isn't for me. I studied um, biochemistry, microbiology and something else at uni, and I didn't want to be a biochemist. 
but I stuck it out because I was like, I've got to. <laughs> Whereas I could have had like two years of my life doing something I wanted to do. But, well, you know, we well, have that. Well, why did you do that, Rachel? Why, why did you stick with it? Um, you said you because should. I think, yeah, because I think, you know, like our, when we go to uni or whatever, our families expect, is there's an expectation, isn't there? And it's kind of like, e even ourselves, we, we're, again, part of... Um, imposter syndrome is that perfectionism isn't it and again when I was talking about women it's like being a high achiever we feel like if we don't tick the box off that we failed and so that buys into that thing that we're not good enough ah, let's ask Marie because she's a woman <laughs> Marie <laughs> rash I can to totally her. relate to that checking the boxes off you know looking at like a job posting or whatever and you look at it and you think well I don't have that I don't have that and I don't have that well I can't apply I mean that's right where my my mind go would go right into what I don't have not what I do have so even if I wanted to see the 20 percent I wouldn't because I'd see that that I didn't have that so how can I apply for that right so that definitely has happened in my life and then for for me the um uh you know, that, that same thing. I studied, I went to college for business when really I probably would have been more, it would have been better to go for art or for something creative. But I took my artistic side and like put it under the carpet because how can you make money with that, right? You know, I had this mindset, this limiting belief. And so I put all of the things that made me joyful and happy under the carpet. I just swept it under there. I did it to myself. I can't really blame anyone. Um, and, and so then, you know, when I get into my forties and fifties, I'm thinking, I really got to do some art. I got to, you know, it's starting to bubble up. It's going to come back. Whatever we push under comes back up in a big way. And I had to start taking art classes and I had to start being more creative because that was under there just waiting to be expressed. Uh, so, that's an example too. So it's just, um, it's really interesting. And then again, the comparison, I'm a conscious breather and I found myself comparing myself to the best in the field, you know, the leaders, the, the ones that, oh my God, you know, they, they've been doing it for 40 years and I need to be as good as them. Well, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I've been at it, you know, maybe five, six years. I'm not, I haven't been at 40 years like them, but I, I find myself still falling into that comparison trap. And that does pop into my, my spirit. And then I have to pull my butt out again and <laughs> say, okay, wait a minute. You are, you're right where you need to be and you're good at what you do and you're not them. And they're, you know, it's like, but I have to really work on that sometimes. Cause I, especially with the social media, it can definitely affect how I view myself. So, yeah. Yeah. and then with the compassion, I think Marie would be really self compassion. Self, uh, yeah. I have to remember my own, what I teach with others, I have to really pull back sometimes, say, wait a minute, you're not doing that for yourself. You're teaching others self care. So sometimes I fall in and I have to pull myself back and give myself the self love, the self care. Yeah. Uh, because and, it's yeah, still. There's something that happens to us sometimes. We're, you know, quite easy to help other people, but we don't really have time for ourselves um Dan, daniel's got a question or a thought you had your hand up daniel do you have a an input there i did i uh found it interesting a lot of what mary said i was also going to say but um i bring this up because one as an executive coach i started coaching about 10 years ago and i instantly looked to marshall goldsmith as the standard and you couldn't have made you know myself thinking of myself as a tiny little peon and marshall's on top of the mountain I couldn't have picked a greater disparity between two types of coaches. So we do this to ourselves, but when you enter into a more logical state and you stop being so emotional about it, because that's what imposter syndrome is. It's a real emotional reaction to not being good enough. But when you look at it logically and objectively, you say, well, it doesn't quite make sense. Why would I compare myself to a juggernaut when I just got started in something? It doesn't make a lot of sense. But when you're emotional, you don't really make a lot of sense. You're just upset and feel uncertain. And the second thing I would say is in regards to the job descriptions, uh, checking all the boxes, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist and I've written a lot of job descriptions for companies. And when conducting focus groups to find what they actually want, if you can check the first three things in that box, you'll, you're most likely gonna be qualified for the job because they will list 
detail after detail after detail to where no person could poss possibly have all of these details. So one, Rachel brought it up that it impacts women more than men, but if, if you can get 20 to 50%, no matter who you are, apply for the role. Trust me, I've conducted hundreds of focus groups. If you can get the first three things on the list, you're probably good to go. Just saying. What do you think, Rachel? What's, it, what's that? That's really interesting. And I think you were saying about, um, you've been coaching for 10 years, but before that you were doing something else. And you know, yes. my, when I pivoted to coaching, I was lucky I've got some good mentors as well. And they were like, remember, you're bringing like 20 odd years of experience. You're not starting from day one. And I think that's common in coaches as well, isn't it? It's like, ah, yes. I'm, a, I'm a new coach. So the last 20 years of my life didn't happen. I, I haven't got those years of experience of dealing with all those different situations. And like many coaches um, come from teaching, like you said, um, psychology, different backgrounds where they are like, they have already, you've already got coaching skills. You've been using them throughout your whole career. And I think that's interesting, isn't it? Do you it think is. as well, like, um, I very much identified with, uh, is it Marie or Maria? Marie. Um, because I actually have quite a few clients that I've worked with who were in corporate jobs who have always wanted to be artists. And now they're in their midlife, they're like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And often that happens when someone's made redundant or laid off. And then it gives people the opportunity or you get some sort of big, you know, big event that happens in life that makes you reevaluate. Like, why am I doing something that's not what I really want to do? And I think that's important as well, isn't it? That what 20 year old us wanted to do doesn't have to be what 40 year old, 50 year old, even, you know, I've seen people in their sixties and seventies starting businesses and it's like, good for you you know who, who we should make our own rules up shouldn't we um and you know once upon a time it was kind of like if you got laid off when you were 50 you were really unlikely to get another job people didn't employ people and they were worried about the age thing and actually now when people are getting laid off in their 40s and 50s they're like i'm going to set up my own business yeah i'm going to take all that knowledge and i'm going to do my own thing and I think that's why we're seeing so many people, and I can't remember where I saw the stats, but actually people that start a business in their 40s or 50s are more likely to be successful because there's quite a high percentage of businesses that fail in the first year, aren't there? Yeah, I think they go, they're, going, they're going with a wise mind, oh, you know, a little bit more cautious and uh, a little bit more, you know, they're, they're actually dependent. Let me ask you another question uh, as we move on. I mean, we talk about imposter syndrome or imposter stories, but there are other types of self-doubt, right? Not just I'm an imposter, because being an imposter sounds quite sort of, um, um, what's the word? It's like, uh, you know, I feel really guilty. I'm an imposter. But there are other ways of feeling inadequate or not being uh, up, to, up to the standards something like, you know, self-doubt. So I was looking at, for example, being um, a perfectionist. I won't do it until I do it 100% right. Yeah, so there's the, what they call the four Ps of imposter syndrome. Yeah. So there's perfectionism, um, procrastination, project paralysis, and then people pleasing, which mm. again, I'm sure everyone in here has experienced. Um, when, if I give you an example of the project uh, paralysis, when, you know, your boss emails you or you take on a new client, for example, different remit, the, the kind of cycle is like you start to worry, then the doubt comes in, the fear, and then you're either going to perfectionism mode where mm. you're over delivering or you go into the procrastination where you're totally avoiding it. You're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to keep putting that off. And it doesn't get done. So that's an example of how um, how that can sort of look in reality. I think as well, like the people pleasing, again, a lot of it stems from childhood, doesn't it? That kind of people pleasing, whether you've had to fight for attention, whether it was at home or at school, you know, that kind of straight A student that comes from that kind of like wanting to be recognized, doesn't it? And it, it is a limiting belief that we set ourselves, but it also can come from our parents. Um, 
you know, it can come from that. If you've got a family background, for example, a lot of people I work with because of healthcare are doctors. And then the people that weren't doctors, didn't get into medicine, become pharmacists. <laughs> there's always like the poor relation. Yeah. And there's a very much, even though these people are like in their thirties or forties, they're still like doing something that their parents wanted them to do. Because if your dad was a top surgeon mm -hmm. and you don't follow in their footsteps and it's common in lawyers as well, then you're kind of letting the family name down. And it shouldn't be like that, but it is. So people then, you are you know, you get in that trap of people pleasing. You're doing something to keep your parents happy uh, or your fam, you know, keep the family name up when it's not actually what you really, really want to do. And art is such a common thing. So many people would love to do creative arty careers, but they've been fed that you can't get paid doing that. It's not a proper career. It's not a proper job. And I'm sure like most of us now who do coaching and do it online have experienced people saying, well, how can you work when you don't leave the house? Or, you know, I'm sure we've all come across that as well, that kind of like, belief um my dad's quite open-minded but he's still a bit like what well, you can earn money from tapping into your computer because he <laughs> used to have to go out and work outside you know and that's how he earned a living and it wasn't an option back then so so, yeah. so, so when we speak about like imposter syndrome or we talk about uh people pleasing or we're talking about perfectionists are we talking about not being our authentic self is this what we're saying so i this is um interesting question so i would say sometimes it is it is our ego isn't it if we're we're saying i'm not good enough or we're comparing ourselves to someone else it can be our ego talking rather than us grounded in our true self because it's our ego telling us we're not good enough or we we need to do better etc whereas you know so we become disassociated from where we are right now because we're we're seeing ourselves as some, something that we should be in the future because mm. we, we can only ever be and marie said it we can only ever be where we are right now you know so we can aspire you were talking about goals we could aspire to be one day i'm going to be the next tony collins uh but i'm going to have to do the work to get there and it's not going to happen overnight so we have to kind of ground ourselves don't we in that energy of like I, where I am right now is where I'm supposed to be and I'm learning and I'm doing the best I can and this is part of my journey and, so the, and being so present because if, so if so the message there is where you are be where you are aim for a higher aspire to another level but try to be who you are is that is that what you is that the message yeah, I think ground and, and grounding yourself in the present moment and reminding yourself that if you're showing up every day, doing your best, then that is good enough. And that's when it comes back to, doesn't it, measuring ourselves with somebody else's ruler because mm -hmm. we don't know where they started. They might not have started at the same point. We only see what's in front of us. We don't see all the stuff behind the scenes. And that's what happens when we compare ourselves to other people we're not really comparing ourselves to the true picture. And we can go into that spiral, can't we, of um, self-doubt because then we're like, oh, but that coach. And even, you know, not everything that's on the internet is true. So when these people are like, oh, I'm making $1 million an hour with, you know, and all the crap that people spout out, actually a lot of it's not true. So if you start getting caught up in comparing yourselves to that, you're going to feel like an imposter, aren't you? You're going to feel like, actually should I really be doing coaching because I'm not making as much money as them I haven't got as many clients as them I haven't got as many followers and you start to then look at all the things and say well, actually if I'm not doing that does that mean I'm not successful yeah so some of the some of the techniques Rachel what, what can what kind of techniques could we use to actually overcome this imposter syndrome or to be something that we are not what, what will we do from a practical yeah. So for me, the very the very first thing, the very basic thing is like in the situation that we're in is asking ourselves what is the truth? You know, what's what's true in this moment right now? So whatever it is we're thinking is actually asking ourselves like what's true in this situation? And I think um, because we can get carried away in someone else's story, can't we? Give us an, give us an example, Rachel. So... so 
a kind of a, a mini case study. It's very mini. But um, in, yeah. in healthcare, for example, you have someone who perhaps wouldn't apply for a job. They don't think they're good enough. Um, they, so I, I sort of used it. So only I've only got eight out of the 10 skills, so I'm not gonna apply for the job. If we reframe and ask and, and ask ourselves what's true, we could sort of say, well, actually I've only got eight, but I can learn the other skills and I can still bring and add value we've got because we all have skills from our lives that we can apply to any job situation and a lot of us forget about transferable skills as well and then I think instead of telling ourselves that we can't do something we can we can carry on with that reframe around I can learn I can't do it right now not I can't do it ever and I think that's important yeah. as well isn't it it's around that I might not be able to do it today but I can learn and if someone's willing to give me a chance and teach me I know that I can be good at it I think that's a very important thing that if someone gives me the chance I think that's where it, it, it that we fall down there because people don't give you the chance until you fake it to, till you make it because getting your foot in the door how often do we we know that as well you know it's, it's getting your foot in the door because then give me a chance and I'll show you what I can do but people don't give you that chance, you know, in, whether it's a coach, whether it's a teacher. Uh, I think that's why so, it's good to take um, some of the things like Daniel was saying about person specs is actually looking at other ways that we can demonstrate. So if we're applying for a job and it's on paper and they don't know who we are, they don't know what we're like as a person. If it's like a good, a good one I use for mums is like, you know, um, if you can manage to get three kids to school, you can feed them, do their homework and then go to work. You're going to be a pretty good at managing people in a team. All your kids have different personalities. So, you know, if you can manage the football team or the, you know, PTA, whatever. Yeah. So you've got the skills to manage people and services. And it's just being able to translate that in a way that gets you a foot in the door. But I do think we should, in leadership, again, encourage people more to be able to say, look, I don't know how to do this yet, but I really want to learn. And that, you know, we, we should be, any of us that work with leaders, we should be um, encouraging them to be more open and work in a perhaps not such a closed-minded way, as in everyone needs to know everything straight away. And I think there's a, there's a term, isn't there, about most managers... Most leaders are, are accidental because they were managers and they've fallen into it. So they've never had any formal training themselves. And a lot of it's learnt on the job. So actually, and that transition, managing and leading are two different things. And leading, we want to be more about developing people, developing people's skill sets. So I think it's important that we do kind of try and make sure when we work with leaders that we we are encouraging them to develop their staff I think Richard Branson's a really good example isn't he so he's like make people um good enough to leave like you know give them the skills to move on but it have have an environment where they want to, where they choose to stay I, I think I think that that's also I think it's something like the, like the family isn't it is that you you know you bring you bring your children up you raise your children to give them the opportunity to leave home and express themselves and do things we also create that security and that warmth that they want to come back. But you also got to be open to let them go out and do things and not just you know, keep them at home and you know, protected. So what, what are your thoughts here? Um, David, what are your thoughts on all of this self-doubt? And we're, we're talking about here reframing as well sometimes uh, what you don't know in this moment, but you will know well, tomorrow. I really didn't have a whole lot of self-doubts about me. I guess it's my upbringing or something. Uh, for example, when I was in the Air Force, I was an airman first class. I found my commander doing things he shouldn't have been doing. I called him on him. And I got in trouble for calling him on him. 
Well, as a 20-something-year-old kid, I didn't know what to do. So I just called a friend of my dad's, Senator John Tower, at that time chairman of the United States Senate Armed Services Committee. <laughs> Oops. That commander got fired. <clears throat> so I, I, I haven't had a whole lot of self-doubts in what I do, just to be honest about it. Yeah, well, what advice would you I give then to people who are younger? Because that's quite interesting, isn't it? I think that happens quite a lot. Someone's younger, they're in a new profession, they can see someone in a senior role maybe behaving not as they should do. And you had the confidence to go and approach them, which a lot of people wouldn't do. They would feel like they've got to be silent, wouldn't they? Correct, because most of the people were silent about, silent about it. And what he was doing, he was trying to do stuff to make money on the side uh, with contractors coming into the Air Force and making money for himself. He got caught. So I, I didn't have any problems doing that at all. What What do you think gives you the edge, that confidence edge that lots of people are missing or interested? My parents, my dad primarily. Yeah, uh, the my, upbringing, yeah. My mom too. My mom was very nurturing. She told us that we can do anything we want to do. And my dad did the same thing. I was flying when I was 13 years old. And the first time I took a control of an airplane, I was in fourth grade, sitting in my dad's lap of a Braniff International Airliner. <laughs> That's almost things. like a whole other like um, debate, isn't it? Like, are people born born leaders, natural leaders? you know or are you made as a leader because you know you've obviously had those leadership skills from a young age where you like i'm yeah. not afraid of this i'm just going to go and do it which is isn't the common for most people is it no not really my dad was a lieutenant in the navy and uh, uh when he was at braniff he was a chief check pilot in charge of all the south american routes so you know i didn't think i could do any worse <laughs> I think there's something there about having good role models and mentors, isn't there? There's, if we've got those people in our lives, things can be very, very different. I think talking about the techniques to overcome this, one of them is, yeah, reframing. One is also finding mentors, knowing you be kind to yourself. As Marie said, a little bit compassionate with yourself because sometimes you're not where you want to be and you just got to understand it takes, you know, it takes, it takes some effort takes time. It's the journey towards where you want to be. Um, let, I, want, I, I want to know, uh, talk about, um, Rachel, the inner voice, you know, the, the, the language that we use when we turn up thinking that we are imposters or we are not, we don't deserve to be where we are or doing what we, we're doing. You know, what kind of language that goes through us so we can actually understand so it's those through. kind of conversations, isn't it, where we say, I can't do this, I'm not good enough, the kind of negative language um, that we use. And it's the kind of, I can't, I I won't, I shouldn't. Um, I always say shoulda, woulda, couldas, you know, things that people kind of, again, beliefs that perhaps are not even necessarily our own. So those kind of voices that tell us we've got to be perfect. You know, I can't do this until this instead of I can do this and that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some there's kind of the, the negative words that we use. So, yeah, I can only do this when I've got this qualification. I can only do this when I reach this certain amount in my bank. When I've, you know, I uh, a lot of people they think success is ticking the boxes in terms of like, I need to get married. I need to have a house. I need to have a car. I need to have three holidays a year. That kind of like what we think we should have and what society kind of makes us think is normal, which <laughs> is not one of my favorite words, but you know, there's that kind of like, if you don't do those things that you don't fit in. And again, some of it can come back to kind of, you know, like you hit a certain, you hit certain points in your um, age and you're like, oh, I'm 30, I should have my career sorted by now. I'm 40, I should be married with two kids and a dog. And then when you're sort of getting to like 50, 60, you're like, oh, actually, I should be thinking about my retirement. And we kind of, society kind of feeds into that and 
we think that if we don't do those things, that we're not normal, I'll say in quotes. Mm -hmm. And, and so let me ask another another question, then I'll give it to everyone to ask as well. So what are what are the risks of um continuing being an imposter? So let's say you know I feel I, I'm I'm into this role, I'm the next Tony Robbins, and I'm into the I'm the imposter. And what happens if I continue doing that? What 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 could happen? What are the risks? We we miss out on our on life, don't we? We miss out on all the good things that could happen to us because we're basically getting in our own way. We're mm. stopping ourselves from from doing the things. Um, I can't remember. There's a book is there around like doing something fifty percent is better than doing it not at all because you're waiting for it to be perfect. So I think even like there's this whole thing, isn't there, about winning or losing, failing, et cetera. But are we actually failing if we if we tried in the mm. first place? And I think that's interesting because, you know, like with me, so I used the example of uni earlier. What was it a failure that I actually stayed rather than a, in reality, you know, so I stuck it out even though I knew it wasn't really what I wanted to do when actually the winning would have been saying from the first year after the first year, yeah, I can do this, but I don't want to. And I'm going to go and do something different. And so they're kind of like what we think is right or wrong, et cetera. It, it, we need to sort of re reframe that as well, don't we, in terms of like if we never did something, we'll never know. And if those imposter stories are telling us we're not good enough to do something, um, and it could be it could be art, couldn't it? Um, things like creative stuff. Lots of people hold themselves back because they're like, I can't paint, I can't draw, I can't sing, I can't. And it's all these things again that we're telling ourselves. Like everyone can sing, everyone can draw. It just might not be Picasso standard, you know. It might be like a stick man, but you can draw. So is 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 this referring to then maybe the expectations that we have of ourselves? In, in singing or drawing or painting or whatever, or writing writing a poem or something like that. Maybe the expectations are too, are set too high. Yeah, I think it comes back to, doesn't it, Com comparing ourselves to somebody else. So someone who's on the TV on a, or a big concert singing, they've got, they've had training, they've had support, they've got lights, cameras, action, all of the stuff. Whereas if we just go up there or do drunken karaoke, it's not going to be on the same level. But it doesn't mean that we can't do it. <laughs> it just means it's not going to be that kind of standard that we're setting, that bar that we're setting for ourselves. Let, let's ask Marie. Marie, you've gone on the artistic journey then. You went. You were in the IT or not before? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. I studied business and, and I had, I guess what I ended up doing is I had to find ways to, allow myself to be creative even in that world because it was seeping out right and so I would find ways to be creative whether it was through writing whether it was through painting whether it was through and um and then I when I got older I started taking some art classes just for fun you know so it it seeps out and I think for me it's the um if you're if I'm always trying to be like somebody else I'm never who I am and the joy is not there for I'm always seeking to be like someone else. Where's the joy? So it's like being who I am is where the joy is. And when I allow myself to be the Marie that, that does have a little goofy creative side periodically or whatever it is, that's when I'm happiest. And so if I can remember that and quit that comparison piece, when I quit the comparison and allow myself to just be, that's when the, I, f I feel the joy and that's when I I think I'm more authentic so let me ask you a question Marie when you try to be someone else and like a, a role model higher than yourself for example as Daniel was saying Tony Robbins or I don't know someone yeah. like that you know do you do you, you feel like you're you perform at a higher level because you're no trying to, you're trying I judge to... myself more I feel like when I'm doing that, I'm judging myself more and I'll never, ever 
be as good as that person that I'm comparing myself to. So really, it's a very do, much self sabotage. Do you, do you perform yeah. at a higher level when you when you're in that uh, comparison mode? Let's say, or not? I I think it's self sabotage for me. I don't think I perform at my highest level because I'm trying to be something I'm not. You mm. know, if I'm trying to be Tony Robbins, <laughs> um there's a part of me that the energy isn't at that level. Right. And, and, you know, Tony Robbins is way out there. So it's like, um, for me, I think, yeah, you, it might help to get you like motivated, but to stay in that state of trying to be somebody else, I think in the end for me, and that's just a personal thing for me, it becomes a self-sabotaging, uh, manifestation because <laughs> if I'm not being myself, I'm not bringing to the table what the gifts that I have. And so I had one coach tell me, which really has helped me a lot. She said, um, think of it as you're developing your own brand of expertise through your own experiences. And when you do that, you are becoming um, more authentic. And, and I think that has helped me more than anything. Yeah, I, I agree with you. When we when I when I talk about when we talk about competition, even with my business, sometimes when someone says to me, "Oh, what about this school or what about this teacher, or whatever?" I said, "Each one is unique, and so you can't compete. You can't comp No one can compete with me. Uh, we can compete on prices, and we can we can compete on the method or whatever. But the life experience and the the the, the presence and the essence are together but with a, with a person. You can't because we are all different." And so I think that's where we have to be really sure about that. That like when you're with me, you can only be with me. <laughs> you can't be with another person who's like me. You can't. And I think when we're really sure about that because all that's gone into making us who we are uh, is is not in anyone else. It's and so we need to know our own values, don't we? The starting point for any of us is knowing our own individual values, what's important to us. And then, you know, part characteristics of um, imposter syndrome are that self-doubt un and undervaluing our contribution to the work, you know, undervaluing what we offer, what we bring to the table. And sometimes we almost um, undermine it ourselves by saying oh it happened because of x rather than saying actually it happened because i'm really badass and i'm good at what i do and yeah. you know i i did the work so again it comes that comes down to that sabotaging our success doesn't it where we're like oh it happened but it's a fluke we kind of fob it off you know it was just just luck just right place right time not i really worked hard and i deserve it and i think boastful isn't that a little bit showing off is that a little bit you know i know it, it, it sometimes to get success you need to be a really sure of yourself you've got to be self-confident but isn't that also a little bit you know i got that result because i'm a badass i mean i mean wow <laughs> I, think, I, I think we should start to acknowledge when we work hard and we get results that we deserve it yeah who, who's why are we you know we, we don't need to buy into the fact that we need to work hard, give ourselves a heart attack and then die. Why, why can't we work hard, reap the rewards of that, whether that is a certain lifestyle, you know, working less, working from the beach, working where we want to, working in our own time frame, rather than success being measured by burnout, which essentially in lots of careers, it's, you get to the top, by the time you get to the top, you're exhausted. And a lot of that is because you can't be yourself. You can't, you have to, if you're in corporate, you have to let, um, work, uh, probably the same in the services, you know, you have to follow their rules and you have to toe the party line. And some of that, if that's out of alignment with who you are, with, you know, it's not soul aligned and it's not aligned with your energy, it's exhausting, isn't it? Like if you've got to show up every day and do something that you don't really truly believe in. And that's what I say, like maybe like with me, when I started off in the NHS, it was a different organization than it is now. And, and I um, never at that age saw a future where I didn't work for them. But as the kind of like values of the organization changed 
and mine did too, <laughs> we couldn't have been further apart. And yeah. so for me, I, I can't be silenced and work somewhere where I can't be my authentic self. And I think it's, it is a waste of people's lives if they can't do that. And I think obviously it's not as straightforward as waking up one day thinking, actually, I don't believe in this anymore. You know, we sometimes we need, that's why we have coaches, isn't it? We have an exit strategy, we have a plan, but we look at how we can start to be authentic because that's when we find our like inner peace. That's when we, we kind of start to shine. That's when our magic kind of sparkles, isn't it? When we're doing what we're passionate about and what we believe in. Well, I, I think it's like having the courage to, you know, to take that first step. It really does. I don't know where that comes from, whether it's a little bit sort of blasé and you just take it. I mean, me with my, this business, I started 25 years ago. My father-in-law said, don't do it. And uh, well, I didn't have any background to be an entrepreneur. Didn't speak the language. I'm in a foreign country. I live in Italy. I was from the UK. Didn't speak the language. Didn't have a clue about the, the legal aspects or the culture. And I just jumped into this. Why did I do it? And I felt a complete imposter, you can imagine. So when I went and I was saying, you know, I, I own a company. Wow. You own a company. I just, uh, I don't know anything about a company. I don't know anything about organizing, meeting, managing people, managing, you know, planning. I didn't have a clue. I knew that. But it was, um, it, was uh, it was, it was, it was just, as I said, it was like faking it until I made it. At a certain point, when people were calling me a boss, I didn't, I didn't feel like a boss. I said, just call me Gary. They said, no. And then I understood that they called me a boss because they were giving me the responsibility. And so the, the <laughs> boss, when the buck stopped, it stopped with him. So there was a little bit of a play as well. You're the boss because at the end, you're the one that takes the responsibility. But anyway, that was, that was me just sharing a little bit of my, the, my beginnings as an entrepreneur. Like you know, now, 25 years later, obviously, uh, I've got a few more uh, securities that say I know a little bit about how to move in, in, in this world. And so. I suppose you could say, couldn't you? Were, were you pushed or did you jump? <laughs> And for, for most of us, like, you know, what was that catalyst moment where we were like, actually, I'm going to start living the life, uh, designing my life on my terms and then making that happen. And yeah. and we do need support, don't we? Most of us need some sort of support system to empower us to do that. Yeah. But it does start with with us, doesn't it? It starts with with what we believe about ourselves. Well, I think what my takeaway, my big takeaway is, you know, congratulations to David's uh, parents, really. I mean, they were an example, I think, to all of us. Uh, if we have children or we have grandchildren or nephews or people that are children that we know, that how much that makes a difference to sending people out who are really courageous and they believe in themselves to to go the extra mile. Because, a lot of, you know, a lot, there's a lot of doubts and self-limiting you know, limiting, limiting beliefs out there. So to have parents like yours um, in, you know, like a valuable resource there, David. So listen, we're coming to the end. We're coming to the end. What are, what are you taking away? I, I'm taking away, don't measure, measure yourself with someone else's ruler. I'm taking that away. So, and I have another one, which is there'll be always someone who doesn't see your worth. Don't let it be you. That was my kind of like... Say final. that again. Right there, there, there will always be somebody who doesn't see your worth, but don't let that person be you. Don't let that person be you. Wow. <laughs> I'm good with one-liners. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose my tip, um, one of the things I do with clients is I ask them to keep a record. and It could be like a WhatsApp to yourself or a folder. Um, and when you get people complimenting you and saying like you've done a good job uh, you know just even in a conversation thanks you've helped me is like screenshotting those little things and then when you are having those moments where you're like I'm not good enough I'm not I'm not good at coaching you know I shouldn't be doing this I need to go back to my day job that you look at that folder and it soon adds up and it reminds you you know when we say what's the truth in this matter you've then got the evidence to support that because it's not just you telling yourself, 
you've got all these people that you've helped and that's why we all do what we do isn't it to help other people brilliant i think that that's what i mean that's what we're that's what we're all here for i mean support supporting each other and this was what i began with this be well a year ago i didn't, I didn't think what's this all about but i mean it does bring value it brings people like yourself and marie and david and daniel and chris and steve so a lot of people coming along and um just supporting each other and that's very important marie what are you taking away from this hour have you got a, a one-liner or something <laughs> and i'm not <laughs> sure i got a lot but <laughs> I think it's a reminder to me, be me, and you be you. And let's, um, I, you mentioned something about boasting. Let's allow each other to, to celebrate. I think I spent most of my life shrinking and dimming my light so that, and I think it's time to, let's all celebrate each other. And and let's embrace that little bit of boasting, you know, like David's really good at it. And I think that's awesome. I want to be more like that, you know, where we actually celebrate and we're in a, a group of people that don't bring us down, but bring us up. Yeah. So, okay. Let's, like do it. let's celebrate. Let's shine the light the next time we see each other. Yeah. Daniel, what are you taking away? Well, I think Rachel said it beautifully. It's, you know, are you afraid to live your life or do you just want to be comfortable living someone else's life? Mm. I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to boast more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. David. Well, pretend with me for just a minute. I'm a 21 year old girl. Uh, I have a job and I make 30,000 a year. And I'm walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> And I go and have parties, invite all my friends over. I provide all the food, all the drinks, everything else. And I want to pretend I'm just like, uh, uh, one, one of those uh, women that think they're gorgeous and they're not. And they <laughs> think they're famous and they're not. You know, <clears throat> you got to come down to reality every now and then. And, uh, you know, be, be, be yourself. And make make your own decisions. Don't try to be like somebody else. Yeah, I think be yourself. Well, Rachel, do you want the last couple of last words before we? I was just on? quickly checking the uh, comments because uh, someone from Mariam, she said one of the things was we the comparison could be someone we look up to. But yeah. I, so I suppose I just wanted to acknowledge that because she, I think she did have her hand up. Um, was like yeah we, we you know we all have role models i would say and there's nothing wrong with that but again you know that that's what they are they're role models and i again if if you really admire someone i say to people go and ask them to be your mentor they can only say no yeah um you know as well like don't, when we put people on pedestals like actually a lot of people if you say you know i'm a fan of your work can can you give me some tips or spare me five minutes the worst thing they can say is no, but the best thing that can happen is they can say, actually, yeah, you know, I was you once. I was started off somewhere and I'm happy to help you. So I think that's kind of really valuable as well, isn't it? If we do look up to people and we want to aspire to be like them, perhaps have a chat and say, look, I really admire what you're doing. And I, you know, that's my goal to be like you one day. And I think also looking at looking around yourselves and finding the mentor, sometimes they're not so far away. You know, sometimes we think that they they were, were they could be just around you just by their behavior. Just observing them, we we, we learn a lot. So yeah, that's... yeah, um, you know, mentors don't even have to know they're our mentor, no. <laughs> and that's a, that's a really valuable piece of advice as well, isn't it? You can pick your mentor; or they don't have to know you exist. You yeah. can learn from them. <laughs> you, they can be your role model. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, but obviously, if you do get the chance, uh, when I first started doing lives on LinkedIn, I approached somebody who's got a huge following, somebody I admired. I was like, I'm going to do my first live. I'm just being cheeky and asking if you'll come on it. And she was like, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, like just sometimes we've just got to ask because like, if someone says no, does it matter? <laughs> we haven't lost anything. But we've but got everyone, 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 everyone on this screen here has been in this be well on this be well journey. And they've been contacted by me, and I don't, I'm, you know, through a screen. 
through a screen, really. And I'm I'm so shocked that people are saying, yes, I'll come along, like yourself, Rachel. You're just saying, you know, I'll share my my knowledge, my journey, and so on. So, and I've got speakers now until the end of uh, September booked in. So I just can't believe it. But it's obviously what people, you know, what we want to do. And I think if if you're open and and, and just just be who you are. And just say just say this is what I'm trying to do. People will say yes or no, and not everyone says yes. But part of the yeah, and some people are. You know, we talked about egos. There's some people that are like, oh, I'm too famous. I'm not going to do this whole little thing for free unless you pay me and that kind of stuff. But you know, we we all know from our journeys in from working in a paid job and going out on our own that actually it it can be tough at the start. And so like being able to pay it forward and help people further along or even people at the same place because we all struggle with different things so you know some of my mentors have been my clients because when we've been having conversations I've learned just as much from working with them as they've learned from me and I think that's important as well isn't it somebody doesn't have to be 10 steps ahead of us for us to learn from them and you know again don't underestimate working with and learning from people that are a lot younger than us you know, there's a certain thing isn't there where people put a barrier and they're like, well, that person's only 25. But, you know, actually in today's digital world, <laughs> those 25 year olds, they know their stuff and they're like <laughs> so much <laughs> better up than us. At maybe like making videos, for example, or some of the things. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's being open minded and not ruling anything out. No, no, I think and, you know, and yeah. it comes down again, doesn't it? We can if we want to compare ourselves to anything is compare ourselves to who we were yesterday and how much further we've come on the journey today. But I absolutely, totally advocate that we all congratulate ourselves when we've worked hard and we've been successful at something, that we say, wow, I did well, you know, good job. And that if we do do not get the results we want, we also say, okay, I didn't quite get where, where I was thinking I was going to get, but I did learn something new. Yeah, definitely. And I can take that forward and use it next time rather than, oh, I'm crap at this, I'm going to give up. Well, I think we can stop there. <laughs> we, we, this, this conversation could go on for hours, I'm sure it could. But thank you, Rachel, David, Chris, Steve, Marie, and Daniel. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys next week, next Tuesday, 5 to 6. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and thanks you. for having me. And I'll definitely, yeah. I've been listening, catching up, so I'll definitely be listening to some more. Um, I'm, I'm, did you say Marie was last week? I probably haven't seen that one. So. Marie was last week. We were speaking about breath work again, taking the work out of breath work, and that was very interesting as well. So Daniel's going to be coming on as well. And so um, let's keep in contact. Let's keep it, um, and just have a look at the, on the LinkedIn page. If you guys are free on a Tuesday, please come along. It's, it's part of our, our growing. Our yeah, growing. So it's good to, it's good for of you to create a space where people can support each other. I think yeah. I don't know yeah. if you get acknowledgement of that enough. You and know. If, you, if you have any interest in speakers, you know, do contact me, drop me a line and just say, I've got this guy or this person, this woman who's got an interesting perspective on life. That's what I'm looking for. Something that uh, doesn't have to, you know, so they just give us a different look on things that we don't see. So drop me yeah, so one of my clients, who, she is what she's calling a body-led coach. And she um, is a leadership coach, but she does it through art. She So she was a artist who went into being a teacher, but because art wasn't a good job. And now she's using that art and working with leaders and taking them out of themselves to lean into that artistic and creative side to see different, to do different and be different. 